The idea of spiritual possession is a concept that has crossed through multiple generations and multiple cultures. But it's not just humans that can become possessed. In multiple cultures and through multiple generations, the idea of inanimate objects becoming possessed is also a legend, story, a topic spoken about. And today, here on Mystery Monday, we are going to be talking about the world's most haunted doll. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, I would really, really, really love to thank all of my producers and my patrons here on Esoteric Atlanta. You guys mean the world to me, especially since my AdSense has been compromised. You guys are really, truly what has kept this channel going. And I love each and every one of you. And I thank you so humbly for your support. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And today on Mystery Monday, we're going to be talking about Robert the Doll. Now, I have to admit that I have known about Robert the Doll for a very long time. I didn't start being a weirdo looking at all these weird stories right when the Great, Awaken a Great Awakening happened. I've been a weirdo for most of my life, but I've avoided this topic because, frankly, Robert the Doll terrifies me in a very respectful way. Robert, if you're listening, very respectful way, I fear you. <laughs> But the other night, I noticed that, I believe it's on Amazon Prime, they have a whole series about Robert the Doll. And it kind of got me thinking watching it because I kind of had this like epiphany that maybe we do need to discuss these, these things here in this Great Awakening, these things that maybe we don't fully understand. And it was one picture in particular of Robert the Doll. And this was a picture that one of the victims of Robert had shown on the series, which is a picture of Robert's aura. Now, many of you probably know this, but for those who don't know this, the only things that can give off an aura are things that have a living consciousness inside of them, right? So human beings, plants, animals, but inanimate objects like toys, chairs, furniture, houses don't give off auras because they don't have a consciousness inside of them. But Robert the doll, being an inanimate object, did, according to this picture, have an aura inside of it, meaning that there is a consciousness attached to it. Now, even before seeing this picture, because I am a weirdo and I've seen a lot of shit in my life, and I definitely believe, there, believe there's more to this world than we can fully explain, already kind of knew that about Robert the Doll. I don't need to see Robert the Doll to believe the stories about Robert the Doll or Annabelle or any of these other toys that seem to be possessed. But this picture, okay, so this picture made me think, we need to look at this further. Because when we start to understand the magic of life and the magic of consciousness, we start to understand our enemy better. And from my belief, there are lots of items out there that perhaps hold attachments to spirits. Maybe not on purpose, but in a lot of cases, maybe on purpose to cause terror, fear, whatever is needed to create that loosh to feed the demons. And so that's why I feel like it's important to discuss this topic. And yes, later on, I will be going over this with Stephanie as well. We'll see if the tarot cards have to say it, say about this story. But for today, we're just going to move forward just talking about this mystery because I want to hear what you guys think too and what theories you have. Because when we do read with Stephanie, I want to present your theories on Robert the Doll as well. Or if you have any, you know, famous haunted toys from your culture, let me know down in the comment section too. We can cover that with Stephanie too. All right. So let's talk about Robert the doll. So the whole story happened or started or is still happening in Key West, Florida. Now, Key West is the southernmost point of the United States. In 1823, Key West became a part 
of America. Before then, it had been owned by the Spanish. Now, something I found in my research that I thought was super interesting is that any of these port towns across the world are notoriously some of the most haunted towns. Key West being one of them, Charleston, South Carolina, where my family is from, being another one of them. And I'm sure all over the world, if you think about these port towns, there's probably stories of hauntings. Why is this? We know in port towns, port towns at one point were like our airports. People came and went so much energy. You think about the idea of traveling. Some people are traveling with excitement. Some people traveling with grief. All that energy coming and going, all these stories. And of course, we hear stories about murders happening in port towns where there's drownings, where there's scuffles between countries. And so we're already looking at a very, very, very spirit, spirited, targeted city before we even have Robert the Doll enter the picture. Now, the Otto family was a family living in Key West. Now, interestingly enough, the Otto family is kind of known in folklore, being a very prominent, wealthy family in Key West. But some of the people I studied said, no, nah, it's not necessarily true. They were upper middle class. The Otto, Thomas Otto, the father, was a doctor, as was his father. But back in those days, doctors did not make the amount of money, according to my research, that doctors do today. And a lot of this was a lot of doctors would work on trade, you know, like somebody would get sick. And so um, they would make a pie and bring it to the doctor's house. A lot of doctors worked out of their houses. That's another reason why old doctor's houses tend to be pretty haunted is because there's a lot of sick people coming and going, people who are scared, losing their life, the doctor's house because medicine wasn't working, whatever, you guys get it. So doctors themselves weren't super wealthy because they would, again, make a lot of their payments from bartering systems. My dad is a veterinarian and he bartered with the local mechanic. And so I would drive my car whenever, when I, when I was 16, I was driving, whenever I needed like an oil change or something done to my car, I would just take my car over to this local mechanic um, and he would just do it for me. And I never paid for it because my dad and him bartered. So my dad would take care of his animals and then he would take care of our cars. My dad and the mechanic had been friends since childhood. So that's like the only person he bartered with. And I didn't know how much an oil change costs until after college when I was living in Los Angeles, because I had never had to pay for anything like that. So, you know, even my dad did that with, with one person, everybody else paid, but, but I can understand that, right. Especially when there maybe weren't huge taxes coming from the federal government on businesses, you know, life was just different back then. But Otto, the Otto family, Thomas Otto, where he did make his money was in pharmaceuticals, which again, I thought was really interesting. And we can maybe get Stephanie to not look at Thomas Otto per se, but just kind of what this meant for doctors back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, because the doctors themselves own the pharmacies. They owned them. And so that's where they made a lot of their money was selling these medications. There were no like pharmaceutical companies. It was the doctors themselves. And Thomas Otto apparently owned two pharmacies in Key West. Now the house that the Ottos lived in is now called the artist house. This is openly out in Key West. You can take a tour. A lot of the, the tours, the ghost tours go by the artist house. And this house was built anywhere between 1890 and 1898. But we do know that the Otto family did move into the house in 1898. Now in Germany at this time, which was known as Prussia, there was a company called the Steiff Company. Now, the Otto family, obviously, Otto is a German name. They were of English and German descent. I don't know if the Otto family had literal relatives living in Prussia at that time, Germany today, or if it was just their descent. But we do know that around 1904, one of the family members traveled back to Germany or Prussia, as it was called then. Some accounts say it was the mother. It was uh, Thomas Otto's wife. Jean Otto, the child who's going to get the doll's mother. Some people say it was the grandfather. So Thomas Otto's father who had gone back to Germany or Prussia at the time. Now the Steiff company was a company that created the first teddy bear. The first teddy bear created in 1902. Well, 1904 is when one of the Otto family members was there and the Ottos bought a doll from the Steiff company. Now, some accounts say that this was just a regular doll, but the doll was 
pretty lifelike in its form. And so many people believe that this doll might have actually been a mannequin of sorts back in the day for like children's clothing. I'm not 100% sure. And they might have, they might speculate it's a mannequin again, because the doll is pretty tall. It's, it's kind of like a, the size of like a four or five year old child. But regardless, the doll was purchased from the Stive Company and was brought back to Key West to give to Gene Otto, Thomas Otto's son, for his fourth birthday. Now, I do want to point out, this never occurred to me studying this story, but in my research, a lot of people asked about why a little boy was given a doll. Again, this never really occurred to me, but according to what, was, like, what I found because of this question that people have asked... I don't think there's really anything to it. There's no like conspiracy there. They weren't trying to make Jean a girl. There's no, nothing like that. Back in the early 1900s, it was very, very common for boys to also play with dolls. That was common. It was also very common for boys to have tea parties back in that time too. And it's interesting. I've said this before. I mean, I have a nephew. I know when boys are little, sometimes boys will play with dolls. And that's not saying anything about what they're going to be in the future. But, but I think when we're young, especially when we're, that young where we haven't been corrupted by the the thoughts or the control of the world little boys also have a paternal side as well boys also have a very nurturing side as well and so i think sometimes when we see little boys playing with dolls they're expressing their paternal instincts just as girls are expressing their maternal instincts now again when hormones start to come into play i know girls will continue a lot of ways with that maternal instinct playing with dolls, whereas boys will then go more into like GI Joes and, and expressing their alphaness, which is fine. But I just really want to express that that wasn't abnormal to give a boy a doll at this time in our history. That was considered a very normal present. Okay. So anyway, now it is said that when the doll first came to the auto house in 1904 for little Jean Otto's birthday, he was wearing like a clown suit. And then eventually, Gene Otto would give the doll one of his old clothes, a sailor suit that he had. And that's the outfit we still see Robert in to this day. Now, Gene Otto's full name was Eugene Robert Otto. Some accounts say that before Robert the doll came to live with the Otto family, Gene went by Robert. But a lot of accounts say, no, he only went by Gene. But the interesting thing is that Gene actually named Robert the doll after himself. Now, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I was thinking about this after I watched the series, about this idea of giving of a name. Now, I know in the Jewish culture, I have a friend who married a Jewish man, and when they started having children, she expressed frustration because she wanted to name her children after family members, but in the Jewish culture, that's not allowed. If a family member is still alive, it's not allowed to name a child after that family member. Apparently it's seen as like a bad omen. But in the Anglican culture, where my friend was born into the, the, the culture I'm a part of, we do this all the time. Um, my dad is Edgar Lee Watson Jr. My grandfather was Edgar Lee Watson Sr. And my grandfather went by Ed and my dad goes by Lee the middle name Lee, if I had been born a boy, I would have been Edgar Lee Watson III. We have that a lot here in the South. I went to school with boys who were like the fourth and the fifth of their generation. Lots of trips. I know the third generation, they call them trip. You know, lots, lots of nicknames and stuff like that. And even for me, I've, I've expressed this before, family names in the South especially are super important. When my mother was pregnant with me, if I was going to be a girl, uh, my mother wanted to name me Laura after a character from the movie, Dr. Zhivago. And my grandmother put her foot down and said, absolutely not that I was going to have a family name. Bryce, my name Bryce is my mother's maiden name. And that was my grandmother's idea. Now, from what I understand, when I was born, my parents lived in South Carolina. My name was supposed to be Elizabeth Bryce Watson, but a lot of the women, my mother, knew were also pregnant with girls and they were all naming their babies Elizabeth. So my mom switched the names and named me Bryce Elizabeth Watson. Elizabeth is also a big family name. My sister, her name is Mary Rebecca. That's the name of my great grandmother on my father's side, my paternal great grandmother. She has a family name as well. And so with an Anglican culture, you'll have families with a bunch of the same names. There's a ton of kids like generations from the Bryce's who carry Bryce as their first name on my mom's side of the family. I have a cousin named Strom. That's my grandmother's maiden name. 
So this idea of, of giving a name to someone or something you love is not uncommon in Anglican communities. And a lot of the, the people were saying is, was, was, was Gene giving a part of his soul to the doll when he gave him his name? I don't know, but part of me says probably not because that was just something that was very, very, very common and still is very common in the South, especially within Anglican families. Now, again, I do bring this up because there is a theory that Gene did give a part of himself to Robert the doll. However, I don't think that this theory comes from the name specifically or the clothes. But I'd love to hear your opinion down in the comment section below. Do you come from a culture where that's kind of a no-no or taboo to give someone a name of someone living? What do you think about that? So pretty soon after Jean's birthday, Jean got very oddly attached to Robert the doll. Robert the doll very quickly became Jean's best friend. Now, at the end of this episode, I'm going to show you one of my dolls that I had when I was a kid that I brought everywhere with me. But this doll of mine never had any supernatural powers, whereas the stories associated with Robert the doll do seem like Robert the doll had a bit of a possession over Jean, if that makes sense. Things would start to happen in the house. Things would break. And whenever Jean would get blamed for it as the child, Jean would very famously say, I didn't do it. Robert did it. Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit more at the end because this could be the creating of a poltergeist, which is one of the theories that I have. But again, we'll, we'll hold that off for the end. The parents, of course, became a little bit frustrated because it seemed to them that, you know, Robert was a kid. He was playing and things happened. Bases break. And he was just not taking accountability for what he did. Instead, he was blaming it on this toy. But over time, weirder things started to happen. The the parents would walk by uh, Gene's bedroom and they would hear Gene like playing with his toys and having a conversation with Robert. But then they would hear another voice in the room talking back to Gene. They would open the door to see if, if Gene had a friend and there would be no one in the room but Gene and his, his toys. And whenever they asked Gene who he was talking to, he would say, Robert, I'm talking to Robert. Then one night, something very peculiar happened where Gene was sleeping and all of the furniture in his room got pushed over. It was very loud, something that perhaps a young child would not be strong enough to do. I mean, hell, I grew up in a house that was full of my mother is my mother is very house proud, which is a very southern thing. And so all of our furniture were like antique furniture is old. You look at furniture from that time, they were heavy, like heavy pieces of furniture. And so even for me at 39 years old, being relatively strong, I don't know if I could push over an armoire or a secretary. This was, this takes a lot of strength. I mean, even when you move with that furniture, it takes two or three minutes to be able to lift it up. Yeah. So the fact that all this furniture ended up pushed over was obviously not done by a small child. When they came in, apparently Robert was standing on the end of the bed, staring at Jean. There were also stories of, of Robert being able to walk and move himself around the house. They, they even say that his face would change with expressions. Well, as time went on, Jean obviously grew up and stopped playing as much with his toys. And so Robert was packed away. Jean ended up going off to New York and Paris to study art. He didn't end up becoming an artist. And while in Paris, he met Annette, the woman who would end up becoming his wife. Now, Annette's name, they called her Anne, and they married on May 3rd, 1930. Now, apparently, Annette did come from a pretty well-to-do family. And for a while, they were able to maintain their lives in New York, Chicago, other places where Jean was able to fulfill his dreams of being an artist. They never had children. But then once Jean's parents passed away, Jean did move Anne or Annette back to their family home in Key West. Once they got back into their family home in Key West, Jean rediscovered his childhood toy of Robert the doll. Apparently, Anne immediately started feeling weird about the situation. It was like all of a sudden Jean was addicted to this doll again. Jean even gave this doll, Robert, his own room. And there are legends and stories that on the second story floor of the artist's house where the Ottos lived, Jean and Anne now, the second generation of Ottos, 
children, school children would walk by and see Robert the doll staring down at them from the window. Now, there are reports that Otto was possibly a little bit abusive towards Anne. I'm bringing this up because we are going to look at Jean Otto a little bit closer at the end of this to talk about the idea of an poltergeist. But from what I understand, he was never physically abusive towards Anne. It was only mental and emotional abuse. One person said that when Anne, Anne was now responsible as the woman for the cleaning of the house and Jean would go around and take pictures of tables to show her exactly where certain objects needed to be situated. And so when she would clean, she would put them exact back exactly where they were supposed to be. This is a form of OCD, which is a form of an anxiety disorder. Again, we're going to get back to that in the back part of with some speculation at the back part of this episode. Apparently, Jean would also do things like with Anne, like whenever he had an art show, he would make her wait outside of the venue for like 10 minutes so that when he first walked into the venue, all attention was on him and not on Anne. Now, in my opinion, I actually think mental and emotional abuse is far worse than physical abuse. It's harder to, to, it's easy when someone's physically abusive to you to say that's bad. But with the mental and emotional abuse, there's a lot of gaslighting. And so I think that in a lot of ways, that's a harder situation to be in. But it is known that Anne did not like Robert the doll. In fact, there is a quote from Anne where she said, I hate that fucking doll. He was Jean's best friend. Of course, he couldn't make any real friends. Jean ended up passing away in 1974. Now, when he passed away, he left all of his belongings and his money to his sister and left the house, only the house, to his wife, Anne. And so he kind of left his, his wife in a very hard position. Like, she didn't have any way of making money now. She couldn't sell his work. She couldn't sell the antiques. She just had the house. And so Anne ended up selling the house to, to make some money to live off of, but that time was only like $50,000. And then she passed away two years later. Well, Robert the doll came with the house and the next family to own this house also had experiences with Robert the doll. In fact, they would have Robert the doll in their possession for the next 20 years. In 1994, Robert the doll was donated to the East Martello Museum, where Robert the doll has lived ever since. Now, this does not mean that Robert the doll's supernatural abilities have ended. In fact, if you go and visit East Martello Museum and visit Robert the doll, you're going to see a board behind Robert with a ton of letters, apology letters, from modern day victims of Robert. It seems that when you go and visit Robert the doll, there are four main rules that you're supposed to abide by. The first one being that you greet Robert, you say hello to him, and you introduce yourself. The second rule is that you maintain respect for Robert, be polite. The third rule is if you wanna take a picture of Robert or a video, you ask his permission. And the third rule is when you leave, you have to say goodbye to Robert. If you look at some of these letters at the back of the wall, you see where the person did not acknowledge the rules and after ended up having a whole string of bad luck, almost like a curse, divorces, broken bones, car accidents, bankruptcy, just one after the other to the point where they felt the need to send Robert an apology letter to make the trauma stop, the curses stop. So how is Robert the doll possessed? Let's go through some of these theories. Again, yes, I believe that there are spirits attached to this doll because I believe in that stuff. And because um, the aura picture that someone took shows that there is actually consciousness attached to Robert. The first theory is, is that he came from the Scythe company already with spirits attached. That the, the moment he came into the house, he was already able to put a possession over Robert. I do kind of believe this because according to the accounts of the story, Robert immediately was hooked on this doll or sorry, Jean was immediately a hook, hooked on Robert, the doll. The second theory has to do with one of the family's maids. This maid or nanny housekeeper for the autos, her name was Emmeline Abbott. And of course, she loved the auto children. But there is a rumor that her daughter was the result of an affair between Thomas Otto and Emmeline Abbott. The daughter ended up passing away. And many people speculate that one of the spirits associated with Robert is the spirit of the child, the daughter, that allegedly, allegedly, 
was the child of Thomas and Emmeline. Some people even say that after Emmeline lost her child, she used black magic to curse the doll so that it would cause the family grievance. I don't believe this because in all accounts I found, Emmeline really, really loved the Otto children. And I don't think that she would have done anything to hurt those children. And even though parents do grieve, we, we do crazy things when we grieve. I do think there's understanding with people that sometimes people just die and it's, there's nothing to be done about it. Sickness takes over and people lose their lives. And even though it's very, very sad to lose a child and the child might have attached the doll, I don't think the nanny had anything to do with it. I'm also not 100% sold that that daughter was the, the product of an affair. I, there was nothing in the research to even garner any speculation that there was an inappropriate relationship between the nanny and Thomas. Um, it, it just didn't seem like that was the case. And I think that if that had happened, I mean, this was the early 1900s. Women had more rights at that time. I think if that had happened, the mother probably would have not been very happy about that. I think you would have seen more uh, tension between the family and the nanny. So I don't actually believe that that child was Thomas's child. I don't know who her father was. And I don't believe that Emmeline cursed the doll after her child died. I think that's where maybe sometimes legend and folklore take on a life of its own and start to exaggerate an already pretty eccentric story. The third possibility, again, has to do with Gene himself. Gene giving a part of his soul to Robert by giving Robert his own name and his own clothing. Now, again, as I said earlier, I don't think the name and the clothing have anything to do with it. But I do understand what poltergeists are. Poltergeists are spirits that are created by us. So if we have a lot of energy, if we have a lot of projected energy, we can actually take that energy and create a being. We see this a lot with teenage girls, especially because teenage girls are so hormonal. They actually can create a poltergeist. They're not ghosts because they weren't souls and spirits that were once inhabited in the body. They are fragments of us that create an entity and a life for force of its own, if that makes sense. And so maybe, just maybe part of the supernatural properties of Robert have to do with a poltergeist that Gene himself created. We know that Gene was very eccentric. We see this in his later life. I mean, a lot of artists are eccentric, but it doesn't, being eccentric also doesn't mean that you're bad or you're creating. Let me rephrase this. I think that there was something going on with, with Gene. Whether we can diagnose that today as a mental disability, schizophrenia, I don't know. Maybe Gene himself had abilities that he didn't know how to control. Who knows? Gene is not alive anymore to, to tell us about this. They had no children. So this is just pure speculation. Now, as Gene starts to grow up, if there was any type of, of stress in the home, like maybe he had one of his parents for a narcissist. I don't know. Let's, let's just say it this way. Sometimes when a child has a narcissistic parent, when they get in trouble for something, the child will do anything to distract from them being in trouble because they know the wrath that's going to follow is probably going to be greater than a parent who isn't narcissistic. Again, this is just pure speculation. And so what we see happening is Gene starts to blame things on Robert the doll. And a lot of people said, oh, it's because he doesn't want to take accountability. Well, if he had a narcissistic parent and he was going through narcissistic abuse from a parent, then I can understand that. It's different from another child, but his parents could have been very mentally healthy and it could have been just Gene being a child and trying to blame everything on Robert. So once again, he doesn't have to take accountability. We do see and later on in life with Anne with the mental abuse coming from Gene. So this tells me that there was something going on with Gene that wasn't healthy. Of course, there are a lot of toxic people, unhealthy people out there that don't go around creating poltergeist. But if there was by chance some narcissistic abuse happening with the parents towards the children, there was no physical 
only narcissistic, then that comes into mental abuse. And the mental abuse, again, as I said, can be worse. And we know sometimes with children, especially children who grow up in a narcissistic home, they either grow up to mimic their parents and become narcissistic themselves, or they become scapegoats and they have to really learn how to grow a backbone. That's something I had to do because you just let people walk all over you because that's how you're used to receiving love is through abuse. But I think in Robert, or speculating in Gene's case, I think we're seeing a pattern here. And I think his angst was so great dealing with whatever he was dealing with in his home that he created a poltergeist that attached to Robert the doll that kept Gene in his possession. Now, again, as I said, maybe there was already a spirit attached to the doll coming into America. And then Gene's experience just made it even bigger, a bigger experience with this doll. I hope that makes sense. Now, it's interesting in this show on Amazon Prime, they did have a psychic meeting come in, talk to the doll and read the house. And she basically said it's all of the above. That there are multiple spirits attached to Robert the doll which I can believe. And so moving forward, when we come into this great awakening, how many inanimate objects are we going to have to cleanse? Are we going to have to release attachments to? Now I will show you because I promised you I would. And if, I don't know if you can put pictures in the comment section, but if you can, I would love to see pictures of your childhood toy and best friend. This was my doll. It's still my doll, Hip. Yes, her name is Hip, H-I-P. I named her that when I was like four years old. And you can tell I've got like tape around her head here because her head's about to fall off. Her arms are coming loose. And this outfit she's wearing was one of my very 80s, isn't it? I was born in 1983. It's a very 80s onesie of a baby, but that's one of my old outfits that I wore as a baby. And I, I put it on a hip, the doll. Now this doll went with me everywhere when I was a little girl. She was literally, before I even started going to school and making friends of my own, she was my best friend. This was hip. I even, I think at one point you can see on her eye, her eye, uh, eyelids, I colored her eyelids. There's water stains on her body. I think I tried to bathe, bathe her a couple of times and her arms and legs and had her plastic, but her body is, is cotton. Now I, when my, my mom's moved quite a few houses since I was a child and she's not in the childhood house that we grew up in. Thank God, because that house was super haunted. But when my, my mom's not much of a, um, a hoarder. And so there's not many of our childhood toys that my mother has held on to. But Hip was one of them. And I actually, in the last time my mother moved, I removed two toys of mine as a kid that I now keep in my closet. One is Hip and one is a teddy bear I had as a child. Now, with that being said, even though I, I really don't ever want anything to happen to Hip because I loved her so much as a child. I can't, it's kind of like the Velveteen Rabbit, you know, he loved the rabbit so much it became real. This doll has such a special place in my heart, but I, as a 39 year old woman, I don't, I don't play with hip hip stays. This doll stays packed up in my closet. I got her down this morning just to do this video with you guys, just to show her to you, but she stays packed up in my closet. And if I ever do have a child one day, I'll, I'll let my child if I have a little girl or a little boy. I'll, I'll let them play with hip. I'll totally let them play with hip, but this doll has never done anything. It's never moved around without me moving it. It's never changed its facial expressions. It's never caused any type of disastrous uh, events in my house growing up. This doll is just the epitome of my childhood love, my childhood holding on to her. Whenever I was nervous as a kid in my anxiety, I would hold on to hip. And so this was just basically, again, like the Velveteen Rabbit, just this, she was real to me. Hip was real to me and only me. And a lot of us, again, like the Velveteen Rabbit, have these toys that were real to us, but not to anybody else. To my parents, this was just my doll. But to me, this was my hip. This was my, my baby doll, right? And so there's a difference. There's a difference between a toy like hip and Robert the doll. With Robert the doll, multiple people were having very nasty experiences with whatever entity was attached to Robert the doll. With hip and most of your toys, there are no experiences, no experiences to share. There was no paranormal phenomenon around them. Only the love of a child. And so with that being said, I absolutely want to hear your opinions down in the comment section below. Maybe 
I just showed you had maybe you had a toy that was like Robert the doll. If you had a toy that you think was doing shit in your house, let me know about that too. I will tell you. So when I was a kid too, I had a Teddy Rupskin and I'm actually really upset that my parents got rid of Teddy Rupskin because I could probably make some money selling Teddy Rupskin now on eBay. But I remember that teddy bear was kind of freaky, like its mouth moved. And my stepdad's nephew, who was my age, <laughs> when my parents got married, my stepdad's nephew was talking about how his teddy rupskin would like bite his got his fingers stuck in the teddy rupskin's mouth for those who don't know what teddy rupskin was he was a teddy bear you put a cassette tape in its butt basically and it talked and spoke to you so that was kind of creepy um there are speculations that chucky the story of chucky was based off of robert the doll those that's not true though chucky was according to the person who created this the horror stories around chucky chucky was based off of my kid sister and my kid brother i think they were called i had a kid sister i had one of those kid sisters but chucky was based off of those toys not robert the doll all right you guys um i hope you're having a start to a really wonderful monday uh, stephanie and i will be up on aquarius rising africa this morning at 10 o'clock i have now been releasing monday mystery at 8 a.m because we go on aquarius rising at 10 o'clock we are going to be talking about black eyed children on Aquarius Rising Africa, as well as some of the orphanages in Connecticut that are interesting. They are connected. We'll talk about that on Aquarius Rising Africa. We were supposed to be on there last week, but Stephanie was a little bit under the weather. So we're doing it this week instead. All right, you guys have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Monday. I cannot wait to hear your theories, your thoughts, your opinions down in the comment section below. Also, again, yes, please tell me if there are toys from your country or your area, like Annabelle, Annabelle's another haunted doll, or Robert, that have this like folklore attached to them. Or if you had a toy that you swear even to this day was doing some shit <laughs> and you weren't. All right. Let me know. I can't wait to hear. And once again, we will be pulling cards with Stephanie soon. That's why I wanted to put this out first, because I also want to hear your theory so we can interact some of your theories and your ideas with Stephanie's card reading so we can get to the bottom of possessed toys. All right, guys, be nice, be calm, continue to do your own research, continue to stand in your sovereignty, and I will talk to you later. Bye, guys.